Hello, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with mentalist Mark Edward. As a professional mentalist, Mark has spent over 35 years in world-class venues, from high-end nightclubs and theaters to hundreds of private party and corporate events. He's most recently appeared on television as both primary consultant and on-air performer on True TV's Adam Ruins Everything, National Geographic's Brain Games, Inside Edition, and Nancy Grace. Mark has also written numerous books, including Psychic Blues, Confessions of a Conflicted Medium. Currently, he travels internationally as a skeptical activist, using his skills as a mentalist to teach and promote critical thinking. Mark and I had an in-depth discussion about the various techniques he uses to create the illusion of psychic ability and the ability to communicate with the dead. It's my personal belief that the techniques discussed by Mark are sufficient to explain how people that claim to be psychic can make others think that they have supernatural powers. Now, one could then say, well, just because you can replicate psychic readings using psychological tricks, that doesn't mean that there aren't some real psychics out there. Yes, that's definitely a possibility. However, I would argue that we would need to see evidence that goes above and beyond these techniques in order to entertain the idea that some individuals possess supernatural powers. If you really investigate this industry, you don't see anything that compelling. And when you do see something that isn't explained by any one particular technique, you have to ask yourself if you're also taking into account the role of random chance, coincidence. Guessing is a huge part of psychic readings, which means you may sometimes see unexplainable predictions just by sheer luck. The bottom line is if you can create this type of experience using psychological tricks, you've got to ask yourself, how would you distinguish the natural from the supernatural? My psychic prediction for this episode is that you're really going to enjoy it. Here it is. Okay, I'm here with Mark Edward. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So uh, we're going to be talking a lot about um, psychic ability, or maybe I should say the, uh, the belief in psychic ability or the perception of psychic ability today. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, normally... Um, you know, I, I on this show we talk about about psychology and human behavior, and I'm usually talking to uh, to a, a, a research psychologist. Um, but you have a very unique set of experiences that uh, that have given you a very strong perspective on on the idea of psychics and and psychic belief. So could you just start by sharing some of your your personal experiences um, that have informed your expertise on this on this topic of, of psychics? Sure. Uh, where to begin is the tough part. I guess uh, I would begin by saying uh, my background is in magic and uh, mentalism. Uh, my grandfather was a magician. So when I was five and six years old, I was uh, initiated into the world of uh, misdirection and deception. Uh, he was my chief babysitter. So when I would go to his house, he would bring out the cigar box that had all these little tricks in it. And uh, not, they were very simple, you know. Uh, uh, he had a lot of little wire puzzles. And so I learned very quickly that if you knew the secret, you could uh, you could make something appear miraculous, <clears throat> excuse me. So I grew up with thinking uh, magically. I, I didn't have any uh, presuppositions that anything was real. And then when I was in grade school, uh, we had those scholastic books. I don't know if anybody remembers them, but uh, they used to bring a free library of free books to the schools. And they were like 
you know, the unexplained or uh, is the Loch Ness Monster real? And right. They were just little pulp books and I just bought those up and read them and I'm like, what if, what if, what if? And then, and the whole time I'm doing magic and uh, for my, my kid friends and, uh, and then we got into, you know, Twilight Zone and uh, watching that and uh, just kind of steeping myself in the supernatural. But I was never really a believer because I saw the real world because I was a skeptic, basically. You know, I was a skeptic, but I didn't know what a skeptic was at that point. It took many years for that to develop. So, now, so at some point... You um, end up uh, doing uh, this type of thing for a living, right? This is no, so it's I wasn't not... doing it for a living. It was a side. It was a side uh, thing. I had a, I had several at that point in my life. I had several different jobs that I was doing. I was teaching. I was. Uh, oh, I don't even want to remember. But <laughs> the point was that. It was it was something that was adding to my income, but it wasn't my only job. Okay. And the idea was I could pick up some extra money and also get to the bottom of how this uh, market worked because that's what it is. It's a it's a psychic market. It's there's uh, no spirituality or or any sort of higher higher end to it. It's put together to uh, take money from people. So. But I wanted to learn the techniques and uh, you can't just go to a psychic and say, hey, how did you do that? They won't tell you. It's like magic. A, a magician won't tell you unless he feels like you have some uh, familiarity and you're not just trying to get the secret from them. So I didn't really make that transition till, you know, qu quite a few years of, of doing mentalism up at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. So it went like this, it went magic, uh, mentalism. Then I started doing a seance at the magic castle. So then it started to get a little more supernatural. And when you're a medium, people kind of expect that you can do something like read palms or tarot cards. So I learned that. And then I found that people prefer that over anything else. They don't really care about a clever uh, magic effect. They just want to hear about themselves. So <clears throat> I started to explore why and how that works and what I could do to, uh, to learn about it and get, get to the real, uh, real issues that were involved with people because I always thought of myself as a people person. So that's what led into uh, skepticism because I really... I wanted to be involved with the group. My, my intention was, you know, I felt like any, if any, anything real was to be uncovered, it was going to come from the skeptic movement. It wasn't going to come from the average person because most of the ones that I ran into already believed in everything, no matter what it was. But the skeptics were actually interested in testing people and uh, being fair about it in most cases. And I found that incredibly uh, alluring. So that sort of brings me up to where I am today. There's a lot in between, but. <clears throat> now you mentioned different techniques that you use um, to, uh, to produce the, the illusions associated with mentalism and with magic. Um, you know, full, full disclosure, you know, this conversation for the listeners, we're, we're operating under the assumption that that these are tricks, right? Um, and these tricks are part of something known as cold reading. And why don't you tell us a little bit about some of these techniques and, and how, you know, I'm sure some people can, you know, think of it as entertainment. Uh, obviously when you were performing these in a, in, a, in a mentalism context, it was entertainment, but what are some of these techniques that are used um, by both magicians and people that are, um, that are presenting themselves as actual psychics? 
Well, uh, cold reading is something that is developed over a long period of time. It's not necessarily something you can learn in a day or a week like you can a magic trick. Uh, it's, it's basically convincing somebody that you know all about them, even though you just met them. You, know, you really don't really have any idea about them. It's a, 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 a symbiotic thing that you do where you are looking for tells right off. In other words, when you meet the person or if you have the opportunity to see them close up, you are looking for the obvious things that we all know about, like uh, their shoes, their hair, their jewelry, their, their fingernails, their general deportment, how they are uh, carrying themselves, uh, you know, their mood, if it's a woman, their makeup, uh, all those things come together in less than 10 seconds, if you're good at it. You, so you shouldn't be staring at the person, you're just taking it in as you sit down with them in this case. Uh, and I can, I got so where I could usually tell everything I needed to know before they even sat down at the table with me. So it's a, it's a, it becomes an automatic thing. Uh, body language, uh, you know, what, what their body language is, a, is like, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's ineffable. You can't, you, you can't really be wrong with it. And so then you start making intuitive, uh, statements. Again, a, a good psychic does not ask questions, which I see all the time today. A good psychic makes statements, bold statements, as if they're facts. And <clears throat> as long as you keep going and you fire these things, statements off, and then you're watching the muscles in the person's face, their eyes, their pupils, uh, again, the way they are, their body languages, then you know that you're you're on the right course. Uh, if you're on the wrong course, they will they will shake their head or they will back away from you. Then you course correct. So cold reading is basically co course correcting for however however much time you have until you get onto something where they start giving you information. And many times they will they will not even remember telling you things. Because right. most people go to a psychic because they have something they want an answer to. So if you get a few of the really obvious things correct that are that are true about everybody, then they assume they can trust you and they start they start pouring out all this information. And so then you, you just kind of sit back and you listen. So I think right. the most important technique is listening. So what are, you, what are you listening for? Uh, you've mentioned these nonverbal types of things that you sort of get when you meet yeah. the person. What, what, so what are you listening for in, the, in, in the terms of the verbal kinds of cues that you're getting from? from the, you well, know? you don't want to say, how, what is it you want to know about? You just listen for key phrases so you know what's bugging them. It doesn't take a lot of uh, time or effort to get the hook in, as they say in the psychic business. Uh, if you have done readings for a while, that's, that's why I say it's not something that can be learned overnight. A lot of magicians have come to me, they say, hey, I wanna learn how to do that. And I say, okay. And they, I say, what part do you wanna learn? And they say, everything. And I say, well, you have to be able to go out and, and do this. You have to practice, you have to understand human nature, you have to, make an attempt to extend yourself to people. It's not like, hey, I'm going to fool you. If you go into it with that attitude, people won't want to open up to you at all. So I think, number one, you have to like people. You have to want to be able to listen to their problems. And then what I would do is I would just, you know, use my common sense intuition and, and tell them, it's like a psychologist will say, what I hear is, and then they will mirror back what the person has just told them. Well, I would never say what I hear. I would say, you know, what I see is, and hold my hands to my forehead and all of that. And generally it would turn out to be, they would say, there's no way in the world you could have known that. Well, you told it to me. And I, 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 I took it all in in the first two or three minutes. Now, it depends on the length of the reading. If it's supposed to be a five-minute reading, 
you got to get to the point right away. And at that point, I'm generally not opposed to asking a question if I haven't already answered their question. But sometimes, like if I would do a 30 minute reading, I just had to just sit there and let them let them speak and then listen and use a fill, uh, you know, the psychic medium filter to uh, to to take it all in and then make make a intuitive and rational judgments at the same time. It's not like doing a card trick. It is uh, it is more like a therapy session. Yeah, that's one of the sad parts to me about uh, about uh, doing this type of thing, and that is that you're using deception, you're using tricks and stuff like that, but it also requires an incredible amount of empathy to do this, right? Like you well, have to understand I, people. You have to. I have to say, does a therapist use tricks? Well, I don't know. That's a, I guess it depends on how you define a trick. I mean, you know, yeah. that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. To me, a, to me, a trick is fooling somebody. Tr a trick is like uh, misdirecting them or telling them one thing and doing another. And, and that is not, that is not part of the game when you're doing a cold reading. It is when you get into hot readings, which is where you have information beforehand, but a cold reading is just winging it, you know, and hoping that you, you strike a nerve somewhere. And generally speaking, if you've done it for a few years, you're looking for the, uh, the nerve that you hit. And then once you hit that, you stay on it. So I don't, and that's a thing. I mean, mid, uh, uh, now there's a mentalism, uh, a mind reading trick in almost every magic act, you know. But when I started doing mentalism, there was just a handful of us uh, around the world who were who were doing this sort of thing. And, and now it's all the rage. And uh, there are some people who they couldn't do a good cold reading to save their life because right. they think of it as a trick. But the problem is if you want to get in, get in and get in deep and have the person want to come back for another session, which I don't necessarily want to do, you have to use empathy and you have to be open to putting yourself in their shoes. That's another, that's not a trick. That's just, you know, what would I do? Right, right. So that that's, that's interesting to hear. So, um, so the the actual intuition the actual listening is a is a massive part of of creating a good reading um, i think so. what are what are so what are some of the other um what are some of the other individual techniques that kind of make up the 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 toolkit that you're using for these readings um I, i've had you know i've had readings before for you know for entertainment purposes and you know you hear uh, you hear kind of little deceptive language type things like you had mentioned where it sounds like they're uh, that they're asserting something, but they're actually asking a question. Um, what are some of the other things in the toolbox that you use to create this illusion? Well, I think you have to project authority. You have to, uh, in, in my book, you, again, you don't ask any questions. You, that's the last thing you want to do is ask a question because they're coming to you. They expect you to know what their problem is. But if you get to a dead end and you can't, you can't get them to open up, then you start to, you know, pick at it a little bit with some uh, questions, but never a direct question. You go, you work around it and you, you say, I'm sensing something about a uh, love interest, uh, you know, something like that. So you're you're trying to you're trying to shake them up and get them to open the lid on whatever's bothering them. Uh, other things are I think that you when I say project authority, you have to uh, you have to surround yourself with as few objects as possible. In other words, I used to work these psychic pairs and they would have <clears throat> all these angels and goddess statues and crystal balls and <clears throat> crystals and I've been all through that and I've learned that it's better that you just sit there with nothing at all because they're coming to talk to you and they they don't want to be distracted by you know if they're like a psychic toy 
psychic reach for a crystal or reach for a, you know, to me, that's when you're, you're, you're taking a pause. So you pick something up and you focus on it. That's when you're really reaching to try and decide what you're going to say next. The best thing is to say whatever comes to your mind. Because what, even when you're wrong, excuse me, you can be right. Because the sitter wants you to be right. So if I say something that is way out of left field for them, right away I can tell by their body language. But I can also say, well, this is not an exact science. So if I don't get everything right, you'll understand. And that's, that's one of the beauties of mentalism and psychic work is you can be wrong and it makes you more human. Uh, nowadays, because most of the mediums or the people who do this <clears throat> are doing hot readings and using Zoom and, uh, and information gathering while they're talking to the person on another screen, you know, they're mining information on Facebook. So it's too perfect, you know? They, they give them all this information that is dead on. Well, of course, the reader is not, a, I mean, the, the sitter is not aware of that. So it appears that they are really, they're really getting hits. But really what they are is information that they themselves posted or, you know. So, but when you're doing a, a personal reading, sitting down with somebody, you're not, you don't have that luxury. You really have to just, uh, uh, focus totally on that person and give them attention. I think that has a lot to do with it. They want your full attention. They don't want to be distracted by anything. Now, you mentioned um, you mentioned hot reading, um, yeah. which is basically getting information ahead of time, basically cheating to try to create the illusion that- Oh, yes, you know, it is, absolutely. Um, it's, it's funny because, uh, um, I always tell people when it comes to just straight up magic tricks, it's like uh, when you when you ask at the end of a trick, how'd you do that? You don't really want to know <laughs> because All tricks, right. tricks, most, you know, solutions to magic tricks are 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 what you would call dirty or, or something that you wouldn't even think of. And you wouldn't even you wouldn't think of it because it, it would require so much effort to 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 cheat in this particular way. Um, but hot reading is is another. That's a part of this activity. What are some What are some ways in which um, you would uh, would would get information about people ahead of time? Well, uh, I use social media. Uh, I use Facebook. I use uh, obituary pages. I use uh, there's there's a whole bunch of search engines that are available. All you have to do is have the person's name. So, uh, you know, for the last several years, we've been researching these uh, uh, psychics that when they get, when they sell a seat to their show or when they're online and when they're, in other words, you can look at the lower left-hand side of your screen there and you can see, I can see your name there, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have another screen over here, I can just go to Google, Google your name in, I can bring up Facebook, I can bring up Instagram, all those things are at my fingertips. But if you're doing a live show, you just, you pick, you, you get the, the, the list of names of the tickets that you've sold. And because you've usually paid with a credit card, nobody uses cash to pay for a ticket to a, uh, to a show, especially now with Zoom. And then you make a short list of uh, three or four people and you get some real kicker things that, again, there's no way in the world the psychic could have known that. We hear that all the time. That's one of our favorite phrases because it's like, oh, yes, we can. <laughs> and as, as long as you dig deep enough and you cover your tracks by making it seem like you're getting this from a higher realm and you don't just blurt it out like it's verbatim. Uh, it's, it, it can be, there are various levels of believability. Some people are, some uh, performers are not very good at it. I tend to think I am very good at it because again, I don't, I don't try to be too perfect. If I tell people it's like watching a uh, photograph come up when you're in the in the old days when you would make prints in the photo studio and you would watch the image come up in the developer that sort of thing and uh, 
but really all I have is a cheat sheet and I've already made it. I already know what they look like because I looked them up. I know what seat they're sitting in and I've done a little bit of homework for every show. So it's verbal deception is tied into that and uh, you are, you are uh, getting the, that person to sometimes break down in tears just by telling them that you just saw some pictures of baby clothes on Facebook. Right. You don't say that. You say, I see, I see baby clothes. Right. Um, and, and also, um, you know, one of the, the most uh, shocking things that, or I wouldn't say shocking, I would say one of the most um, damning pieces of evidence that, that psychic ability doesn't exist is the difference between the group kind of readings and a one-on-one -on -one session. Because right. if you assume that psychics are, if you assume that there's uh, psychics are real and that you're actually getting information from this a spirit realm, if you were in a room one-on-one -on -one with someone, you would have only their spirits coming through and giving you information about them. And if you were in a group setting, it would be difficult because you'd have a you'd have all the spirits kind of you know flying around and it would be extremely difficult and the readings wouldn't be that good they'd be right. much bet they'd be much better if you were in a one on one setting but yeah. in reality you don't see that right it's much more difficult to do a one on one reading that's of substance versus if you have no I, I i don't think either one is difficult once you once you are uh aware of uh, of how to how to give the information out a little bit at a time and not make it too overwhelming and also with a big crowd you have uh, what's called the, the law of large numbers which means with a group of three or four hundred people I can say uh, I'm getting uh, something in the chest area it has to do with an auto accident does that mean anything to anybody and, you know, two dozen hands will go up and all you have to do is pick one that looks the most gullible and then focus down in on that person. Maybe not two dozen, but the point is, it's not unlikely that somebody would would have a heart attack or be in a car accident or you say, I see a male figure who was lost at sea. You know, it's the law of large numbers, which is one of the things you work with in a large group. Oh. something where you don't have to have any any pre-show work pre-show work is a fabulous tool to learn to uh, manipulate but it's only part of the the bigger picture so so but if you're on one-on-one -on -one, you can't just say i'm picking up uh you know the old the old one is a, a scar on one knee you know <laughs> you're you're likely to get a hit anyway with one person or they'll make a connection and say, oh, that was my father. He, he had a bad knee. Because again, the sitter wants you to be correct. They don't want to admit to themselves or to anyone else that they paid money to get bad information. Yeah, so, I used yeah. to do these in, in my statistics class, which was, I didn't have time to do a full fake reading. Um, so I had to use sort of the, I, I was using high probability hits to demonstrate the Barnum, the Barnum effect. Yeah. Uh, so I would have students, I just take the three pieces of information that I'd randomly pick a student and have them kind of, you know, say that I'm talking to them and I would give them the scar on the knee. And it's, you know, I'm seeing the, um, I'm seeing, a uh, your workspace. There's a lot of old post-it notes near your workspace. When you and, like um, dogs or, you know, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was interesting because, you know, and then afterwards I would just, you know, raise your hand if this was true for you, raise your hand if this was true for you. And, uh, you know, it would allow everyone to see that, that these facts uh, in isolation, when someone's looking at you and they're, it feels like they're talking to you, it seems like it's unlikely. It seems like, because when you say a scar on your knee, they don't see a scar on their knee. They see when they fell playing basketball when they were 16. Right. So it feels different to them, but then they look and they see all the hands up of the students in the class. Like, yeah, that's true. I've got a scar on my knee. And it kind right. of brings, brings them back to reality. Yeah. Well, a lot of times that's why when you, when somebody goes to see a medium, uh, we've had this experience where 
you know, they're really uh, blown away initially, but then a couple days later, they start to think about what you just said, things like that. And then they're like, wait a minute, you know, that's not, that's not so accurate. Isn't that true with everybody? You know, right. so, but if you're good at it, you can get very specific by using the social media, which is now uh, <clears throat> running rampant. In other words, since COVID, mediums are not able to do these big arena shows like they used to. So of course they're doing Zoom meetings. And Zoom meetings are a lot easier to work with <clears throat> than, uh, than these huge arena shows because all the names are right there. And all they have to do is have another screen or an assistant who writes down specific things and holds them up on a whiteboard right about here behind the camera. And, you know, the psychic just reads it and, and says it out loud. So it's, they're, they're winning and, and the skeptics are losing. That's the sad part about it. Now, the number one pushback I get when I try to have a, engage in sort of a dialogue about, you know, mm. questioning some of these experiences people have had with psychics in the past or doing a demonstration, the number one uh, pushback I get is just because you can do tricks and things like this to create the illusion that you're getting information from beyond, that doesn't mean that there aren't real psychics. You're doing tricks, but, and, and I'm sure I, I've had people ex admit to me that even, you know, maybe 90% of psychics are BS, but you know, that doesn't mean that the 10% you got to find a good, not my psychic, right. Or, or, or doesn't, it doesn't disprove that, that there aren't people out there that have powers. How do you, how do you respond to something like that? Well, first of all, <clears throat> Susan and I, when we go out and do our lecture tours, we have a phrase that we use that we say to somebody like that, we say, what is more likely? Right, yeah. Is it, is it more likely that this person can communicate with dead entities or they're just a very clever manipulator? You know, you decide because science is not fully agreed on any of this and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to tell you what to think but the, the bottom line is, here's what we found after 30, 40 years worth of investigation. And we're still open to, you know, you know science would know about this. If there, was, if there was one person on the planet, and we, I like to say, he would think about it. If you think about it in the clear light of day, if there was one person on the planet who could talk to dead people, he or she would be the most dangerous person on the planet mm -hmm. because they would be in a position to know things that could change the whole fabric of reality overnight. So you got somebody, bring them to us and we'll test them, but they never show up or they, they make excuses and they say, Oh, it doesn't work that way. Well, how does it work? Because if it doesn't work through science, like we're doing, then, uh, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna uh, admit to anything. It's you're the one, the psychic is the one making the claim, not us. Right. We hear it all the time. Uh, I used to hear when I was doing the psychic business and then I kind of changed, opened up and made my, uh, my views known through my book. <clears throat> the psychics that I used to know said, oh, poor Mark, he's really clairvoyant. He just doesn't want to admit it. He can't handle it. So psychics have an answer for everything because that's what they're trained to do. They, they are trained in verbal deception. So yeah, you can think not my psychic, but if you, if you do the research and do your homework and don't just go into it as a shut eye, which means with your eyes closed and your heart open, then you're going to find that most of the things you're hearing are meaningless. I mean, so so what if grandma had a, a, a rose garden garden and used to wear a, wear a hat? You know, I mean, that is not earth shaking information. So the proof is somebody who really is willing to be tested uh, and, and replicate what it is they're saying. 
and it, it's never happened. So, right. But now, people get very, very ticked off when you confront them. So if it's somebody like that, I usually just leave them alone because they're not going to change their mind. So what percent, what percent of practicing psychics are actively, are actively conning versus they've deceived themselves into thinking they have powers? Do well, you think- again, I can give you my opinion based on my experience. Other mm-hmm. people may have totally different opinions. But my opinion is about 95% of the people out there who call themselves psychics or mediums are complete charlatans and they know exactly what they're doing. They are, they're cheating the the public. The other 5%, I kind of split down the middle 2.5 and 2.5. 2.5 of of that five are people who are uh, deluded they're mentally ill. Uh, they they think they have they hear voices. Maybe they have mild schizophrenia or some other form of mental illness. Uh, they do believe that they're real, but they are not. They are not thinking normally. They're on a uh, and, and they're not aware of it. So they're some of the hardest people to get through to. The other two point five percent are uh, very empathic, very uh, intuitive, uh, loving human beings who are actually trying to help and may have a much higher ratio of, uh, of uh, care for other, other human beings than all the rest of them put together. Uh, so I don't have any, any problem with them. It's just when you put that 5% against 95%, the odds are not good. Right. The right. odds are that you're going to get one of the 95ers and the 2.5ers are going to get uh, either left behind or noticed. Look, if you find somebody you can talk to and they're not trying to sell you a stinking candle or something, let them, let them talk to you. If they can help you, again, what does a therapist do? Okay. The only difference is the, the psychic or the empathic or clairvoyant or whatever attaches a uh, spiritualistic uh, aura around themselves in most cases. They don't say, hey, I have a degree in psychology because that would scare away a lot of people who can't afford a therapist in any other situation. So yeah, I I would put it at about 95%. Now, so for those 95% that are actively, you know, conning or charlatans, part of me thinks that, that they, you can be aware that you're using uh, what, you know, we, what we would call tricks or, or manipulating, but also helping people. Like it's, I, I've got, I get the impression that some of them think that the ends justify the means. Like I'm, cre- I'm using, you know, these, these silly tricks to try to manipulate somebody. And, but, but at the same time, you know, they want it, they want to be here. They get something positive out of it. You don't, you don't think that, that you can be sort of, you can be using, using, doing the con and also thinking like I am helping people. Now think about what you just asked me and you tell me whether you think that's good or that's, that's living a lie. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if I even have to answer that because if somebody knows that they are conning you, they're not going to help you. They're going to get the hook in and they're going to keep you on the line as long as they can. That's the problem. When I do, when I used to do personal readings, I would tell people, okay, I've told you everything I need to tell you. I, I don't ever want to see you again. And this is not a personal judgment because I, because I like you or not. I just don't want to see you again. I've told you what I need to tell you. Go to somebody else. Because it's, it's no, that is not right. They're not, they're not helping anybody. They are trying to make a living off other people by lying to them. Mm-hmm. So no, it might, it might seem like a, a little, a little, uh, uh, at first, it might seem like a bomb to 
to uh, rub into the sore and make it feel better, but it's an addiction after a while. It can become an addiction. And it's so yeah. the psychic may try to convince you that they're helping people, but you have to give me some pretty darn good evidence and not anecdotes because anecdotes are not evidence that you really helped somebody and that you didn't just take advantage of that person to the point of where they're out. Like we, we just did a TV show called The Con, the Con which is uh, the same guy who did uh, Bullshit with Penn and Teller. And our se segment was about a woman who lost $180,000 wow. to a, a mother and daughter psychic team in New York City. So, you know, I mean, and that woman, she probably thought she was feeling better every time she went back. So, no, you need to forget that idea because psychics will turn that against you. They'll say, oh, the skeptics, we're helping people. No, the people who are helping other people are grief, certified grief counselors, therapists. Uh, I try and stay away from priests or religious people because they can be scoundrels too. But, you know, there's it, it, people just want someone to talk to. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if they know how to get the hook in, you are dead. You are, you could lose everything. So is there somebody out there who's helping somebody? Yeah, they're in that 2.5%. If they don't want any money and they say, come by my house anytime, have a cup of tea, you know, and they don't want you to bring them the voodoo, you know, bring back a thousand dollars in an old sock or anything like that. Fine. I don't have it. That's why my book is called Psychic Blues, because I'm really, I've always been interested in that 2.5%. It just has, I wouldn't even call it a gift. It's just their, their personality lends itself to be a listener. And they give, they give good information that's sound and logical. Uh, I like to use the, uh, the idea of, you know, you go to, let's say you go to, a, in the old days, you would go to a circus and, or a sideshow and there'd be this, uh, this grizzled old lady and she'd be sitting at this table and she would have a, a babushka on her head and a gold earring and she's probably 80 years old and you sit down at her table and suddenly she starts telling you all these things about yourself and you're just like, wow, there is no way no, she could have known that. Well, there is because She's probably been doing that and just that for her entire life. And she learned it from her mother and her mother learned it from her grandmother. So why should you be surprised that somebody knows the keys to the kingdom like that? So, it, you know, if that person is, is, a, is a person of goodwill and it's, it's done in a, an entertaining and uh, socially correct fashion, I don't see a problem with it, but that's not where we're at in society today. Mm -hmm. Today, we are in the golden age of the con. All you have to do is look around at who we had for president, really, and it's still going on. So, yeah. Now, uh, let's let's uh, talk a little bit. You, you call uh, the people that are being read the sitters. Um, let's talk a little bit about about them for a second. What? How would you describe? Um, the uh, the personality of someone that is drawn to psychic phenomenon. I mean, you've 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 uh, you've probably met both uh, people that are kind of skeptical and given them readings, and then you've also probably met people that are all all in to begin with. Right. What uh, could, what would you uh, how would you describe the personality of, of people that are really interested? Well, in obviously, the people who are skeptics are a lot harder to break through. But since they show their body language, as soon as they sit down, you know what you're dealing with. So you have to use some very convincing. Uh, it's still obvious, you know, you, you can't. Uh, you can't, it's very difficult to go to a psychic for a private reading and not give off these tells. It's like gamblers can see a tell, like a muscle in their eye will twitch, 
their the muscles in their face where their smile is will go up or down or sideways or there's a hundred different muscles in your face. So and unless you are completely silent and you do not move at all, you can still read a skeptic. You can still read what they're more or less thinking. Now a believer, you can say anything you want and they'll make a connection for you. So there's a whole spectrum in between and that's really what you're dealing with. Is it true that intelligent people are sometimes easier to fool? Uh, I think that's probably more true with magic and sleight of hand because an engineer will know where to look or what the what the uh, pattern is of the, of the operation or the modus that's going on. But everybody can be fooled by a, by a, a clever uh, medium, especially if they're not aware of the hot reads. Because I do, I do shows for uh, <coughs> skeptic groups. Susan and I just, uh, before COVID, we, we did a tour of New Zealand and Australia. And, and what, what I did for my part in the show, I was kind of acting as the opening act for her her presentation is uh, we got a list of the names of the people who bought tickets for that show. And then we spent about an hour making uh, a, a cheat sheet that was on the podium right there. And then I, before the show, I looked, looked up people in the audience to see where they were sitting. So I was, my targets were already set. And then, and that's why I love pre-show because with pre-show, Everything is already done. All you have to do is walk in and deliver it. And these are skeptics. These are people that say, oh, no, I can't be full. And when they were done pulling their jaws up off the floor, you know, because they, they can't figure it. They don't, they don't know that they just a week ago put up a picture of their, their pet uh, border collie that uh, they had to put down, you know. Right. So give exact information like your dog died. You know, I say, I see that you're really missing the black and white animal of some kind. Interesting. And now, like, yes, yes, that was my <laughs> dog, Corky, you know. So, yeah, if they can be fooled, even in I, a skeptical yeah. audience. So there's nobody who I would say is, is completely uh, with it, as they say in the carnival business, unless you're a professional psychic yeah even when i've done the the simple high probability hit exercise with people um on i would say probably one out of every 10 that uh that i get a couple hits with they are emotionally they feel something like yeah even even after telling them it's a trick yeah they oh, still yeah. feel something right <clears throat> they'll tell you that you know we understand that some of those things you did was a trick of some kind, but boy, when you said that one thing, you must be the real deal, you know? So it gets to be a slippery slope. Now, some people uh, have the opinion that if you go to a psychic and you pay them hundreds of dollars, um, you're a sucker. Like, you, you know, they, in other words, they, bl they blame... <laughs> um, Okay. So yeah, they, they blame the victim. And I know different, different people have different takes on the amount of responsibility that goes to the victim in these cases, because their own free will, they're paying for it. Um, their money. So, so what, you know, how, how much weight do you give to this case? Do you, uh, would you defend the, these people that are shelling out money or do you think that, um, that it's, it's their, their own fault? Well, I don't think it's a matter of fault. I just think it's a matter of uh, law enforcement because that's basically law enforcement says, hey, if they're stupid enough to fork that money over and there's nothing we can do to stop it. But that's just a dead end and nothing ever gets done. That's why you end up with somebody losing $180,000 or, uh, or their home or their business or, you know, it's, it's really a racket. So yeah, I think that's true to a certain extent, but I think that you have to you have to cut out the, the evil at its roots. You have to say, look, you this is false advertising. You did not 
reach this dead person. You merely did a bunch of hoodoo to convince this person that you had this ability. But the thing is that the police are, they, they don't do anything unless you can, unless you can prove like we have a friend who uh, is in New York state who helps these people collect, try and collect their money back. But it's usually not all of it. And it's usually too late, too, too little, too late. So I have great empathy for people who have been taken, but usually they're multi, multi millionaires. So to them, it's, it's their money if that's what they want to do. But we just need one or two multi, multi millionaires to turn around and say, no, this is not right. Because that, you know, that doesn't make it right. Just because you can afford it doesn't make it a, a right thing. Because there's lots of people who are scraping to put food on the table and who, who pay for a reading or go to these shows. And they are bereaved about their, their murdered or missing child. And they can't afford $10, much less $1,000. So it's about them. The, the other you know, percentage, I don't know what it would be, of wealthy people who can, who can afford to dabble in it. Who cares? It's the, the little guy that's getting hurt. So I don't, I don't feel sorry for people. I just would like to educate them a little so that they learn how to recognize what's, what's going on and see that, that, oh, that guy talked about that. Isn't that interesting? So to, to wrap up uh, on that note, uh, how, uh, what is your message to uh, people that are curious about this topic? And, and how, do you, how do you convince somebody to be skeptical of these things, but also maintaining um, an openness to uh, to what what we don't understand from a scientific perspective, because what I feel is that sometimes when you start going into the debunking process and you're like, you know, this is how this works. This is how this works. Just think about it a little bit. S some people feel that you're you're trying to take away this little part of their brain or their heart that feels that there's something unexplained out there. Mm. And by, by explaining away psychic <clears throat> phenomenon, you're basically saying no one can have powers. No one can have, no one can, can have an ability that isn't understood by science. So how do you, uh, what, what, are, what are the essential elements of that message that have to be there so that you don't feel like you're ripping out someone's, uh, you know, belief in something more? I think that the bottom line is uh, I'm not a debunker. I don't think of myself as a debunker. Those days are over because it's way too big to debunk a specific person. Now it's a, a social phenomenon. So what I would say is, uh, you know, it's buyer beware. If you wanna do it, just go in with your eyes and ears open and know what to watch for. I guarantee you go into one of these mom and pop psychic shops and you sit perfectly still and you don't move and you don't ask a question, they'll say, here's your money back, which says everything. Because if they were truly gifted psychic, they would know some very specific information. And even now, if you use your credit card to pay in advance, they could still say some things and, and open you up. So they lift, they use a, a lever to get under the rock and dig around and so I think that uh, my message is uh, it's not entertainment. It's, it's uh, making somebody cry on stage in, or in front of a television camera. That's not entertaining. That is, that, that is a, a very sad thing to see. And it's very easy to do once you understand the, the, the prompts and the, the uh, verbal deceptions in order to get there. So I'm not trying to say such a thing isn't possible. I'm just saying, ask yourself, what is more likely? Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. This has been incredibly enlightening. I feel like uh, very lucky to get a, a peek behind the curtain a little bit into this process. Yep. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being on. It's been a pleasure talking to everybody. I hope you will... Uh, 
get something out of this. I hope that I uh, gave you some things to think about because you give me things to think about too. Mark, head to themarkedward.com or visit his Wikipedia page. You can also check out his book, Psychic Blues, Confessions of a Conflicted Medium. I really enjoyed it. Mark offers up dozens of firsthand accounts of his readings, from his years as a 900 number psychic to his private performances for celebrities, all while allowing the reader to peek into his internal monologue throughout these encounters. Head over to his website to purchase a physical copy or download the audiobook on iTunes, which is loaded with additional content you can't find in the paperback version. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on iTunes. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me at why do we do that podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question, why do we do that? <laughs>